actually supposed to be premiered in um, February, and now it's going to be coming in 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 the fall in um, Santa Santa Rosa Symphony. So, oh, Santa Rosa, wow. Yeah, that's, right, people, uh, well, if you're on the West Coast, David, keep us posted. It's supposed oh. to be premiered in um, February. And now it's oh, wow. going to be getting... coming in, in, in the fall. In um... Oh, you know what I'm hearing? I think I'm hearing the YouTube. I'm getting I like just, a... I just stopped it. I, I oh, just okay. stopped, uh, muted it. That's terrific. Because I that forgot would... I was sharing my sound at the same time. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, so, I will absolutely keep you posted. Any... Yeah, you just any... Yeah, I sure will. I sure will. Any West Coast... Uh, things that we I'm got doing. Some really great people I'm gonna, here. I think we should start letting people in. Wonderful. Okay. All right. I'm gonna we're, hit. We're ready. All right. Do it. Where are they joining? Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for all for coming on in. We have a few more minutes before we start, but we are very glad you are here. If anyone you know uh, can't make it or getting on Zoom isn't the easiest thing, we are also going live on YouTube. Feel free to share that YouTube link. You just need to click on the live on YouTube uh, button right on the top of your screen and you can get a link and share it with your friends. And to those of you who are watching on YouTube, hello. Oh, wonderful. I see some klezmer mishpucha in the, uh, in the group. Hello, everybody. Always great to hang out with the mishpucha. Right? Yeah. Music's a family affair. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for joining. As we were just saying, if any of your friends or musical buddies that you usually jam with who you can't jam with tonight, but uh, know they would love this, feel free to invite them to the Zoom room. You can also share this, uh, share our YouTube link. The YouTube link can be found just by clicking on the top where it says live on YouTube and you can generate a link and feel free to share. Um, and while you share, you can also think about uh, following our, our YouTube channel as well. It's always a good idea. Hello, Lori. It Fran. sounds like Fran. How are you, Fran? Thank you I'm so much good, for coming. I'm good, thank you. I gotta get my volume up a little bit here. <laughs> Maybe I need to bring this closer. Test one, two. All right, it is five o'clock, and so I think that means that we can get started. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lori Black, and I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. And we are very pleased that you are able to join us today for our, our this evening's installment of the Jewish Music Masterclass, a series that is coming up on its one year anniversary. So uh, it, it's pretty amazing that the, this program has been going as long as it has all through quarantine um, and Tonight is going to be a very interesting and, and 
fun discussion. So to make sure that uh, you are, are up to date on all of the programs that reflect the American Jewish experience, please make sure you're on our event mailing list. You'll find the link to the mailing list in the chat, or the simplest thing is to just Google UCLA Jewish music and you'll find a link to our webpage. Coming up, we have several very interesting programs uh, that are free to the public and we would encourage all of you to attend. Um, on March 4th, we will be collaborating with our colleagues at UCLA Hillel to present Remembering Theo Bekel, Theodore Bekel, actor, activist, and idealist. And this program will also be curated by Amy Bekel Ginsburg. So it's going to be a very interesting program and it will be taking place at 5, p uh, 5 p.m. PST, 8 p.m. Eastern time. On March 15th, we will be offering uh, a birthday celebration to the late Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg of blessed memory. Um, this, the, our program for the love of opera celebrating RBG's 88th birthday will be looking at various uh, operatic solos and how they related to who she was as a Jew, as a jurist, as a person. Uh, and this is in collaboration with our colleagues at uh, the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, as well as Opera Philadelphia and our very own Opera UCLA. And then the next installment of the UCLA I got muted. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, the next installment of the UCLA Jewish Music Masterclass series will feature uh, the up and coming composer, Julia Adolph. Um, this is exciting for me because Julia and I were schoolmates and at the time I had the opportunity to premiere works of hers. L little did I know that she would go on to be, uh, she would be at this time writing for the Boston Symphony and LA Philharmonic um, uh, among many others. So that will also be a wonderful program and it will take place at the same time as this one, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now with that, sorry for all of the announcements, but there's so much wonderful programming that we have going on. Uh, and with that, onto this evening's program. David Krakauer is, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I was asked, how would you describe David Krakauer's music? And I struggled for a while because I, where do you start? Um, widely considered one of the greatest clarinetists on the planet with his own unique sound and approach. David has been praised internationally as a key innovator in modern klezmer, as well as a ma major voice in classical music. In addition, his work has been recognized by major jazz publications around the world. He received a Grammy nomination as soloist with the Conductorless Chamber Orchestra, A Far Cry, he received the Diapason d'Or in France, for the dreams and prayers of Isaac the Blind. His wide array of project solo appearances and multi-genre collaborations include groups, composers, and individual artists such as Ancestral Groove, the WDR Big Band, and Abraham Inc. co-led with Fred Wesley and so-called, the Emerson Quartet, uh, Marin Alsop, uh, and Leonard Slotkin, just to name a few. Krakauer's discography contains some of the most important clarinet recordings of recent decades. Among them are the Dreams and Prayers, of which received the Diapason d'Or, the Twelve Tribes, uh, Label Bleu, which was designated Album of the Year in the jazz category for the prized uh, Der Deutschen Schallplatzen Kritik, and uh, Paul Moretic's uh, Pulitzer Prize winning composition, Tempest Fantasy, which is on the Naxos label. He is also recorded with violinist Itzhak Perlman, the Klezmatics. Don Upshaw and Osvaldo Golahov, again, just to name a few. Um, and today we are very pleased to explore not just his amazing range of artistry, but how it connects with him as a, as, as a Jewish person, how his Jewish experience has been a part of his musical uh, and artistic journey. So with that, uh, David Krakauer. Spotlight. Hi, David. Thank you so much for being with us. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, yeah. I thought you were. I saw that picture. I thought you were going to play some music. So uh, do you want to jump right into music? I just wanted to give, give no, you a chance let's... to say hi first. Oh, good. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> wow. I I see the room is filling up. That's 
That's amazing. You know, uh, when you play a live concert or you have an interview, you can't, I can see there's 195 people in here. So that's amazing. Thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs> well, uh, the first tune that we're going to be listening to, and we're, we're just listening to a clip, but this is one that um, I, I, when I teach my students in Klezmer, this is one that, uh, as I mentioned, they always gravitate towards. They're, they're always wanting to listen to this one, to play this one, find different ways to jam over it. And that's Funtashlich from uh, Rhythm and Jews. So what can you tell us just a, a little bit about it and we can listen to it and then we can talk more right after. Um, well, this is from the album with the Klezmatics, Rhythm and Jews. It was my first Klezmer record. Um, in back it recorded in Berlin in December of 1990 for the German record label Piranha. And, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing uh, moment. Uh, I think we returned to Berlin in, um, uh, oh gosh, oh no, it was earlier. It was uh, February of 1990. We went to Berlin and we were um, in the former East Berlin performing in the uh, Festival of Political Song. It, it was really an incredible time walking through holes in the Berlin Wall and, and just that, that moment. It was, it was really uh, just a, a, a very, very exciting, very, it was, uh, the electricity was in the air. And I really think that um, that that time with the Klezmatics, you know, when we came to Europe, um, you know, the first Klezmer revival had, we could say might, be, might have run its course a little bit from the er, early mid eighties into the late eighties. And, and, and there was a, a, you know, it was, I think it was sort of waning. And then um, I got into Klezmer music just kind of for fun. Um, and then the Klezmatics heard about me and then they said, well, why don't you come to Europe with us? And suddenly we, we went to Berlin uh, in the late 80s and there was a, um, a room full of screaming, yelling, dancing, partying Europeans. Um, and some were Jewish, but most were not. And it was this real kind of uh, this, this amazing energy, uh, people coming together and this big interest in Jewish culture. Eastern Europe was opening up. I mean, it was like uh, Glasnost was in full swing. Um, the Berlin Wall had just fallen. Um, and and it, was, it was really uh, just an absolutely incredible time. And that, that music comes from that time. Well, let's get a sense of what some of that electric energy felt like. hate cutting these tunes short but there as i said at the beginning there's so much repertoire to get through um so 
let's let's talk a little bit about just like what's happening there because you're doing some really interesting things i mean there's clearly a blend of cultures happening here different sounds being evoked that aren't necessarily um you know at you know related to that that first wave of klezmer not not necessarily as tied to one tradition but looking outward a little bit more so what what can you tell us about the process there well, you know, I, this was kind of like I'm remembering back to the days where uh, we rehearsed, the Klezmatics rehearsed um, at this uh, studio in the East Village called Context Studios, which was uh, uh, the old Burger Klein department store. So it was like an old school uh, department store on Avenue A. It still had the Burger Klein sign. Um, and we would go in there and there were all kinds of, you know, like punk bands and dance companies. And, and it was just like this amazing um, mix of people, artistic people from the Lower East Side. And so we would go about once a week, cosmetics and go and work. And, and usually uh, we would usually we'd have a three hour rehearsal. We could sort of get the rough idea of an arrangement. So we came in, you know, when we're like, yeah, well, uh, we could do that great Naftuli tune from Tashlich, uh, but, you know, it would be great to have like kind of a shiftateli Arabic beat because, you know, as a show of uh, solidarity and friendship and cross-cultural, um, yeah, cross-cultural uh, love. And, um, and then we actually had a, a Nubian uh, percussionist in Berlin uh, joining us with the, with the amazing uh, uh, drumming of David Licht, uh, along with this wonderful Nubian percussionist. Um, and so um, that was kind of the idea we started. And then, you know, I brought my bass clarinet and I picked up my bass clarinet and I said, hey, everybody, you know, and I just started blowing on top of that beat. And everybody was like, yeah, that's the sound. That's really cool. You know, uh, because, again, someone was asking, uh, Seth was asking, about a precedent for bass clarinet and klezmer and i was saying of course kiora feidman but i was bringing in you know um in term you know more of like the jazz avant uh kind of crazier sounds um into that mix and uh, and and kiora feidman of course was the uh, bass clarinetist with the israeli philharmonic so he brought that aesthetic to his music which was absolutely gorgeous. I heard Giora's uh, first concert in New York. I think it was like 1980 or 1981. Um, and, uh, you know, and the bass, I think he played like a Puccini aria on the bass clarinet and it was gorgeous. So, you know, but that I was coming in with that, with that other, uh, other aesthetic, more of a jazz and improv and avant uh, aesthetic. So that was it. We, we developed the tune and, you know, uh, you know, like I remember one time we were rehearsing in context and Frank was like, oh, yeah, uh, three hour. Yeah, it's about a three hour rehearsal. We knock out a tune, then on to the next <laughs> one, you know, and then, you know, and each one of us would come in and, you know, uh, Alicia would come in with uh, Alicia Spiegels and Lauren Sklamberg. Uh, what an you amazing know, community and, you had to work with, too, where it's just as you described it, a lot of energy toward toward the ends you know <laughs> yes yes really great time those years with the klezmatics were uh really 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 wonderful so why don't we uh listen to uh another track with the klezmatics this one um from jews with horns uh and this is the doina um and this one being that it's not too long i thought we could go ahead and listen to the whole thing sure
and hear you speak. It was Amazing. Um, so th there's a lot going on there, a, a, a lot to pull apart, and I know that we can't we can't pull it all apart. But um, I, I did want to highlight first. The best thing would be if you wouldn't mind describing to our audience what a doina is, um, so we can talk about just a little bit what makes this one unique, which is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, a, a doina is basically like um, a, a Romanian shepherd song, uh, sort of free. Um, non-metered uh, kind of piece. Um, but, you know, it was interesting. I mean, you know, there's a lot of anecdote, a lot of stories that are passed around, you know, goodness knows what, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I can't separate truth from fiction anymore. But I mean, people would say like, um, oh, you know, the the uh, the Jewish shepherds were like learning from the cantors in Romania, you know, and then they would sing their doinas, you know, while they were out in the fields. And then, no, they said, no, but it was the cantors who were learning from the shepherds, you know. And so uh, I kind of think of it as this uh, interesting synergy. You know, of course, all so much of this is lost to us. We don't we don't really know anything, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, we know what we hear on recordings. We can take some educated guesses. Um, but I think of, uh, um, you know, I think for me that that um, I I think of uh, uh, yes, cantors were learning from gypsies, cantors from Greek. I mean, you know, every there were depended where you were, and there were lots of lots of stuff. There was lots going on, and I remember actually being at a party with the cantor. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, Cantor Mizrahi, and we were doing a session for the Milken Archives. And then after the session, and you know, when it was a very tough piece of contemporary music, and we were all working our tuchuses off, you know, to get it right. And then um, afterwards, uh, you know, um, uh, Cantor Mizrahi started like letting loose at the table and drumming on the table and singing these Sephardic songs. And I was like, where, where's the microphone? Turn the microphone on now. <laughs> you know, it was so awesome. Um, Amazing. But, you know, so there was that like incredibly, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, this, this kind of incredible energy and and i think that you know i like to think that i mean this is my own personal opinion but when you hear jazz there's jazz is to me when it's really true um and you know i don't know i could probably get crucified for this but okay i'm gonna just say it anyway i think that you know for jazz to really um be have the essence um it has to have blues in it and in the same way i think if you don't have doina in or, and doina slash cantorial music in klezmer you don't have klezmer uh, you have to have that element you have to have that influence um you know i i have not really deeply studied cantorial music you know I'm, I'm a kind of a person I just sort of absorb the influences around me but I can tell you that I've had you know many 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 cantors great cantors over the years who say you know David you're a Hazen you you just play like that with that feel and it and it's just an instinctive thing it could be uh, you know, hearing uh, the music, hearing it in klezmer, um, mm -hmm. and then also um, hearing my grandmother's Yiddish accent and hearing the lilt of how she yeah. spoke. And I think that, you know, it just all sort of, you know, when I started to play klezmer, I studied really hard. I took the Dave Tarras records, the Neftuli Brandwine records. I studied the primary sources extremely hard in incredible detail. Um, but it, and, and so it was a, a lot of work, but at the same time, it felt super easy to me. It felt like this was something that you know, I didn't grow up with it, um, uh, came from a completely assimilated family. Parent, my mother, would, my late mother was a classical violinist. I mean, we were listening to like and, and classical music and stuff. 
Uh, but as soon as I heard klezmer music and started to really get into it, I was like, oh, this is, I, I get it. Uh, this is, uh, this feels like coming home to me. Um, and not to divert too much from the actual content of the music, but there has been an ongoing discussion as to uh, where the title or where the name uh, Jews with Horns come from, comes from. And I don't know if you can speak to that, but I might put it to you. Well, I didn't, I didn't come up with these great titles, uh, you know, Rhythm and Jews and Jews with Horns. And, you know, partly it was playful, going to be silly, you know, taking, yeah. I mean, a really horrible thing. You know, someone said my wife's public junior high school classmate asked her if she had horns in the 70s. Uh, you know, these, these, these beliefs do exist. Uh, this, this kind of, this kind of, poisonous thinking and you know we just we just sort of said like well you know we're jews with horns we got a trumpet we got a clarinet we got our horns you know and and you know you throw it back in 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 yeah. the face of 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 racism and 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 anti-semitism and bigotry in general it's like just going like bigotry you know screw that we're gonna we're gonna you know, so it was playful. It was supposed to be a funny title. It is a funny title. People sort of titter when they hear it, um, you know, uncomfortably a little bit. Uh, yeah, Jews with space there's, lasers. Thank you. Always, yeah, we got them too. We got horns. There's we got always a space moment lasers. when you tell somebody to listen to this album and they're like, it's called what? <laughs> Look, the Jews with space lasers is directly connected to the oh, Jews yeah. with horns because of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, QAnon is the protocols of the elders of Zion just rewritten. So, I mean, you know, so this is like, you know, we, this, this, this has always been important too in, in my work and, you know, the cosmetics. Uh, when we went to Europe, we represented without getting on a soapbox, without waving a flag, we represented multiculturalism, um, you know, and that was felt really wonderful, um, you know, and, and coming out there and just going like, we, we, we represent these kinds of values. And I think that's, you know, that feels really good. That feels really good to be a musician and to say you can be political um, in, in that very strong way with your music. Absolutely. And I've continued that on and on. Uh, my partner, uh, Tag, and I, uh, you know, of the Muslim ban, uh, organized two big concerts to benefit the ACLU in New York City. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's, just, it's just so important, you know, to be doing these things and to be standing up. Thank you for your work. Um, so now we're going to turn just a little bit. Uh, and jump to a fairly different project, uh, which is uh, the Cronus Quartet project that you worked on, um, uh, The Dreams and Prayers of Isaac the Blind. Um, so we're gonna listen to uh, just a chunk of what is either the first or second movement, depending on where you start counting. Um, but before we do, what, what can you tell us about this project, how it came together with Cronus? Um, well, I, uh, you know, I uh, just, um, one day, I think I was in France and uh, some, somebody, my manager called me and said, um, uh, I want to schedule a phone call with you and David Harrington of the Kronos Quartet. I think they want you to play with them. So I was like, wow, that's so cool. And then they said, we've got this piece and it's by this uh, uh, young Argentinian composer, Osvaldo Golikov. And, and uh, they sent me a, a, a cassette. <laughs> a cassette tape of it and I listened to it because it had already been premiered but um, they wanted me to to do do the recording and I I checked it out and I was like okay I can I think I can put my stamp on this piece and it feels really good and man that piece has just been so uh, wonderful to me uh, you know playing it with with countless quartets and then it was um arranged for orchestra uh, for, and then I, I recorded it uh, just a few, just a few years ago with a far cry. 
and we got a Grammy nomination. So we came out to your fair city and uh, that was lovely. And, um, and just having a chance to play it with quartets, with symphony orchestras, uh, really all over the world from, uh, you know, Europe, Europe to Costa Rica to, uh, yeah, just all, all over the place. So really, really exciting. All right, let's give it a listen. So that is a particularly interesting chunk. And what I really wanted to ask you about that is how much of that is you and how much of that is coming from the goal, coming, coming from the page, you know, the ink. Um, I know so much of what we do is looking at a page and making it into something that it, that wasn't necessarily there. So. Um, well, there's um, two things. One is that uh uh, the, um, you know, I always make this joke with Osvaldo. I tell him, um, you wrote some music and I give you 20% more. <laughs> I play all the notes you play plus 20%. So uh, basically he said to me, uh, you know, he wrote on this that it is for klezmer clarinet and string quartet. That means that you're supposed to bring the klezmer style. I mean, if, if you wrote a piece for jazz clarinet and swing string quartet and someone couldn't swing and just played kind of like straight ahead and, uh, um, you know, it, it just wouldn't work. Um, so um, th that's the point that the piece has to be delivered with the, the correct style. I've had people from symphony orchestras write to me, I wanna play this piece. And I'll, I'll tell them, and I'm not joking, I'll say to them, go and learn like 100 klezmer tunes, learn them by ear, transcribe them, work on the ornaments, work on the phrasing, then go out and play like a bunch of Jewish weddings. And then I said, and then you can play this piece. Now, you know, the thing was, when I first got into this music, I loved playing weddings. And I still love playing weddings, but I like playing weddings if it's friends of mine or people I know or, you know. But when I was first playing those weddings, you know, it was the mandate was get people up and dancing, get the crowd moving, get the energy going in the room. And, and that was really super important. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, th I think that's so much a part of it. Playing, the, you have to play the piece stylistically correctly. And by the way, the last movement, which is a real, just a setting of the 
Kvakarat uh, Rosh Hashanah prayer, um, I try to play more, a little more cantorially, a little, it's kind of simpler, not so ornamented, not so wild, more, a little more like liturgy, like cantillation. And, and then the other movements, even though there are uh, very famous prayers from the High Holy Days throughout the whole piece, uh, there is the whole klezmer vibe that I try to bring um, and the primitive vibe. There's shofars. It's, you know, it's very primal. There's a I, lot I of... love the shofar motif at the end there. It's amazing. Um, yep. So if I were a classical clarinetist at uh, with a symphony orchestra, and I wanted to play this piece and I called you desperately seeking your advice, would the first thing be to listen to a bunch of Terrace and Brownvine recordings or? Yes, absolutely. I, I, um, I'm seeing in, my, in the chat here, how would you explain klezmer clarinet to a classically trained player? I mean, uh, you know, that again, that's, that's actually checking out records, listening to primary sources people might come to study with me and I say, well, you know, I can help you. I can, you know, but I said, but don't listen to my, you know, if you listen to my recordings, I'm flattered. You listen to Giora Feidman, that's fine. You listen to whoever you want to listen to, uh, you know, to, I could name hundreds of players, of, my, of players of my generation, a little older, a little younger, but I'm, but I say to them, listen, to the primary sources, listen to the Yiddish speakers, the people who came from the old country, who came with the culture, the whole, their brain intact with this, you know, way of think. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of life. And so, you know, I, when I do my music, I want to be, you know, I'm not, I don't want to play recreations of those old records. That was their time. That was their experience. You talk about being Jewish in America. My experience being Jewish in America is extremely different from Dave Tarras's and Naftuli Brandwines. And I don't want to sound, you know, sit and make a record that sounds like a kind of, you know, it won't have a vibe. It won't even be half as good as Dave Tarras or Naftuli Brandwine. So I want to write my own music. I want to come from my own experience. I want to do my own arrangements of traditional tunes, my own versions, my own takes on them with my own thoughts and feelings that, that makes it authentic to me. You know, that's, and it com that's... comes across in your playing. I mean, we, we, you know, you, it's we. There's a reason we all connect to it. Why there are now 336 people on this call who connect to your music. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so let's go ahead and let's move on to our next track, um, Klezmer Alabashe from a new hot one. What should we know about this this tune and album? Um, well, that, that was basically this idea that I had. I was, uh, I was um, asked to do some music for the Zalfelden uh, Festival in um, Austria. And they said, do something new. And it was 1997. So that was the 100th anniversary of Sidney Bechet's birth. birth. And Sidney Bechet was the great New Orleans jazz clarinetist. He was a contemporary of Louis Armstrong's. He was from the Creole culture. And I thought, wow, Sidney Bechet, Creole, coming from New Orleans, French as his native language, Naftuli Brandwine coming from Poland, Yiddish as his native language. So they were kind of like these immigrants in a way uh, coming to New York City. And I thought, what if these two great giants of the clarinet and immigrants, uh, Jewish, African-American came together and jammed. And I thought, wow, that would be amazing. So I put together a, a, a klezmer tribute to Sidney Bechet for my second record. It was called uh, um, Klezmer New York on John Zorn's Sadik label. And I did that suite. And one of the pieces was Klezmerella Bichet, and I re-recorded it a couple of years later for this, uh, for the French label, La Belle Bleu, for this, a new hot one. And uh, the guitar player on that is uh, Mark Stewart, who was, uh, who is uh, um, from time to time, Paul Simon's music director. And he's an amazing, 
amazing uh, multi-instrumentalist, incredible musician. So there he is playing guitar and my pal, Kevin Norton on bass, uh, Kevin Norton on drums and Ted Reichman on accordion and Nikki Parad on bass. And so that was a, a totally fun band. Oh, what a great group. And I, I realize I haven't said it yet to this point. Um, so I'll make sure I mention it now. I know that we're going through lots of repertoire and lots of albums. And if you can't write them all down or you're listening in the car or something like that, um, all of this, uh, the full disc, uh, discography uh, of David Krakauer can be found on the website, davidkrakauer.com. Um, where else should people look for your music? Uh, Spotify, iTunes, Bandcamp, anything I'm missing? Yep. <laughs> uh, yep. Probably, I, I would say Bandcamp in, is first because I could actually get paid. <laughs> Go to Bandcamp first. All those other ones. Forget those other ones. Bandcamp. You know, Spotify, well, that's a whole discussion, but uh, Spotify is a great index for discovering music. And I love the convenience of Spotify. I don't, I don't personally use it that much. Um, but um, yeah, you can, you can pretty much find me anywhere, anywhere good music is sold. There it is. All right, let's listen to this. be easy for this this session to go three hours and just listen to all the tracks <laughs> and that would actually be fun but we're not going to do that to all of you i promise um so uh the next tune that we're going to listen to continues this exploration of uh bechet in 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 klezmer um so bechet and the romanian wine cellar off of uh klezmer new york which was on uh one of the several albums that you've done off the Tzadik label. Um, how does it relate to, if it does relate to the previous track, the, the Bechet reference? Uh, well, it, it's part of that. that part the, of the series of the combination. Part of the, of, part of the suite. And then I just thought of that, that they, they might have met in a Romanian wine cellar, kind of thinking about like the old Moscovitz and Lupovitz uh, on uh, second and second, you know, they're, and going, uh, or the original description in that in that book, uh, Jews Without Money, which is an amazing description of that Romanian wine cellar going down the stairs and murals of shepherds and sheep and uh, fields, and then you go and plaster grapes, and then there was a, a flag of America, American flag and a, a flag of Palestine, and then, then on the wall behind the bandstand, 
was a mural of Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. It was like a crazy place. And, and then there was uh, Joseph Moskowitz playing his symbolum. And I just thought, wow, what a setting. And I kind of thought it would be kind of eerie and creepy and, and delightful and sensual and, you know, just kind of like, ooh, kind of a really crazy, cool um, atmosphere. So I thought about that. It really tells a story. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and and I and I also then there's a thing I will probably not get to it, but there's a place where then I put two rhythms at once. And there's a sort of an umpa, and then I. We're actually the, we're going to start close to the beginning, uh, cl- uh, leading into that. We're going to listen oh, to a bit there, so it's okay. perfect. <laughs> cool. Well, the crazy juxtaposition cross rhythms. Yeah. Here we go. something almost Ivesian about that like I it, you know the, the old John uh, John Ives story of oops someone muted you oh oh um the, the Ives idea of two marching bands coming from separate directions that's what I hear only it's in the Klezmer French world <laughs> It's a pretty, it's pretty much that idea and just like a kind of a dream sequence and a sort of a little almost quasi hallucinatory and yeah, yeah, just, uh, just crazy. Uh, I, 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 when I listened to that, like, I think, how the hell did I come up with that? That was, <laughs> whew, but that was really, you know, that, and, and it's funny how your perception changes because I remember coming out of the recording session and we did the record and I was on the street. It was like three in the morning and I was talking to my manager at the time. And I said to her, I said, I, I didn't get anything. It was re- I was recording for four days, nothing, no- nothing good came out of that session. And now it's one of my favorite records, 1998. And I still love to 
listen to it. It's inter interesting. It's um, well, it's great to know the story, the, the the visualization that you gave us behind it now, because I can really hear hear the moving parts. Cool, cool. <laughs> And um, uh, you were asking, I'm trying, I'm kind of trying to follow the chat and I'm sorry, I'm trying to, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to answer things, but I, I can't keep up with you all. But, um, no problem. but Lori, I did see, uh, you want to play the canzonetta then? Should we jump to the canzonetta? I if you like, prop. whatever you like. <laughs> I feel like a DJ here. Um, so just for time, uh, we, we are going to, to jump just a little bit. Um, so, so some of uh, the classical work that you've done has been with one of our organizational cousins, the Milken Archive. Um, we are, you know, we are funded by the Milken Family Foundation. We operate through UCLA, but we have a great relationship with the Milken Archive and they have done just an incredible, incredible 30 years worth of uh, recording of American, Jew of Jewish music more broadly, but uh, American Jewish music. Um, and the Canzonetta, you, you told us not only was it, a, you know, an interesting project for you, but that it influenced uh, future projects as well. That's correct. That's correct. Well, the Canzonetta was actually a kind of arrangement by my teacher's teacher, uh, Simeon Bellison. Simeon Bellison was a clarinetist. Um, actually, Neil Levin of the Milken Archive wrote a really incredible article about this uh, Zimro ensemble, and it was a St. Petersburg group that then, you know, was touring the world. I, I think they kind of got stuck in New York. I think they ran out of money, from what I understand. Uh, but, you know, the people who were there, the cellist was became... Um, uh, very big in the Yiddish theater, and Bellison became the principal clarinetist to the New York Philharmonic, and you can hear him playing on the uh, famous Yiddish film uh, Green Fields. So this canzonetta is by the composer Jacob Weinberg, but it was arranged, and who I met Jacob Weinberg's granddaughter recently, and I believe she just wrote about him. I think she just published it. I've been so crazy busy, I haven't had time to digest that fact but um she wrote she wrote this book so you should all check it out very interesting composer um and when i was in, in my early 20s my teacher leon rushnoff said oh, here's this uh, piece arranged by bellison and he gave me the clarinet and piano uh version of this this piece and that was one of the little germs Aside from playing David Schiff's uh, opera, Gimple the Fool, with the, at the 92nd Street Y, uh, Jewish opera at the Y, that was one of the germs back in the early 80s that got me eventually into Klezmer, much later, like eight or nine years later, but uh, listening to this piece. And so then suddenly, um, you know, I started this uh, relationship with the Milken Archive and I was able to record, you know, all for Ben Amotz and um, Robert Starr's concerto and a short piece by Osvaldo Golikov, Rocca Tequia, and, um, and, and this, this lovely uh, canzonetta with Gerard Schwartz and the, it was the Berlin uh, Radio Orchestra. This was a fantastic experience. Thank you. 
So uh, as you mentioned, this one um, connected to what I, I believe the, the next recording that we have, which is uh, from the Bubba Mises record, the Bubba Mises title track, um, which after going from that might be a little bit of a shock. <laughs> well, you know, uh, back in um, uh, back in 2000, I met this young man. Um, uh, he's like 20 years old at uh, Clez Canada, the festival there up in the Laurentian Mountains near Montreal. And um, he gave me a recording of, of some music that he had made. Actually, that was in 2001. I had already met him the year before. And he said, hey, man, I, I did this record. It's called The Hip Hop Seder. And I said to myself, oh, my God, what will they think of next? I mean, hip hop on, you know, Passover songs on top of a hip hop beat. But then I listened to it and I was astounded. And this young man, of course, was so called um, and just hearing the, the, the how brilliant he was and how he really but just short little samples woven together so perfectly and so beautifully. And I thought, wow, this is amazing what he's done. So I snapped him up as a featured artist with my band. And then after a while, we, um, you know, uh, we started to, you know, record some together. And then this record was a fully, we fully collaborated on making this record uh, together. And then he said, what about that little classical piece you recorded with orchestra? The, the, because of, it's Bubamysis. Actually, you know, you see it says, it says in the uh, title of the music in Russian, it says something I can't read. And in uh, German, it's Großmutters Erzählungen. And in uh, English, it's Grandmother's Tales. But then in Yiddish, of course, it's Bubamysis. So it's like, <laughs> so anyway, we decided uh, to make the album Bubamysis Lies. My grandma told me, of course, it isn't lies. It's tall tales. It's exaggerations. But lies sounded pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> But now we come to a period that I call the battle for identity. Lies my grandma told me. Yeah, superstitious devices. Lies my grandma told me. What? Urban mythological rules. Bubble mice. Yeah. come to a period but now we come to a period didn't mean to start it over there but but i did mean to stop it so, still playing yeah that was a sample of uh herschel bernardi um doing a, a, a comedy show and what was interesting about it was that his we listened to that record and we were actually this record is um 
it, it, it didn't feel like comedy. It felt super serious, you know, and the battle for identity. Herschel Bernardi, it was, it was a heavy, heavy record. Um, and we were, that was really great for us to, uh, you know, to do that uh, and to use that sample and to, that was, that was fun. Well, I'm recognizing that we are starting to, uh, we're starting to get to that point. And I, I, but I also want to make sure there's a couple more tracks that I would love to get to. So we'll probably go for uh, just a few more minutes, folks, and then we will go get to a Q and A. Um, I did want to make sure that before the evening was out that we heard just a little bit from your project, Abraham Inc. and a little bit from Breath and Hammer, I think too amazing projects uh, that, that you've had going. So um, why don't we quickly, uh, I'm gonna mix it up just a little bit. And could you tell us just a little bit about the uh, Breath and Hammer project, which is something completely different? Uh, yes, it is. Um, that's a project that I um, have been doing for the past few years with my partner, the pianist and composer, uh, Kathleen Tagg. And basically uh, we took the uh, very classical ensemble of clarinet and piano and then added loops and samples and Kathleen's amazing playing inside the piano, the incredible sounds she can get with just a couple of pieces of paper, a little chain on the strings, scarves, um, all these different kinds of, um, it's like uh, she actually calls she, she, she bills herself a pianist and she plays piano and piano orchestra. So, and all of the things are actual full orchestrations, but realized that the piano between the piano itself and the loops and samples that make, that flesh out the orchestra. Um, and then it's the kind of, the idea is the ties that bind us. We start with a piece by our very, very close friend, uh, Kinan Azme, the great Syrian clarinetist and composer. And we have a couple of pieces by John Zorn, a piece by our Cuban American friend, Roberto Rodriguez, um, a piece by the Brazilian music compo uh, composer and accordionist, Rob Curto, a piece by Emil Croitor, the great Moldavian master who now lives in Israel pieces of our own, and finally some traditional klezmer pieces at the end. So it ties a lot of cultures. And, and we did a big concert at uh, the Pierre Boulez Zal in Berlin a couple of years ago and had 16 foot scrims all around us. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. That's nice, yeah. <laughs> and and that, that was in the hall. And then of course the cameras inside, the scrims were projecting the great um, LA based visual artist and video designer, Jesse Gilbert, uh, put, the, put that, uh, you know, that whole video thing together. But this was a, a real concept. Um, initially of Kathleen's, she was like, wow, you know, we should, we should get like uh, cameras on us and put us up on a screen and bring us closer to the audiences. And then it kind of kept going from there. And of course, this hexagon was built for the beautiful theater in the round um, at the Pierre Boulez Zal. And uh, then Kathleen also composed little interstitial pieces of like electronic music that basically took bits of all the pieces and then they flew around the room. So it was a wow. whole experience, uh, you know, in between, <laughs> the, in between the main pieces. So pretty wild. I would love to see this one in LA, but for right now, the, the video will have to do. We're coming to LA anytime. We wanted to create an immersive, multi-layered concert experience that celebrates our shared humanity and our connections. To Sorry, I clicked on the wrong video. <laughs> well, that's a pretty one, good one. <laughs> it is a good one. I was, would, here, I have... Well, then I'll just go ahead and show it. <laughs> it's kind of an overview. We wanted to create an immersive, multi-layered concert experience that celebrates our shared humanity and our connections to each other as human beings. Our starting point was a collection of lead sheets of pieces by brilliant friends and colleagues 
who come from different parts of the world, backgrounds, points of view, music, and styles. pieces of music are linked by little interludes that act as musical bridges containing hidden elements from the piece that comes before and the piece after. They are designed to surround the audience with sound and to fly around the space through a multi-speaker setup, reflecting the influences coming to us from our friends from all over the world. orchestration, look and feel, lighting, and way each composition unfolds visually. arrangements of our friends' pieces using only sounds of the clarinet and piano, layering them up into a giant orchestral texture with loops and samples. I don't think there's enough uh, prepared piano pieces in Jewish music for what it's worth. Um, so if there's any composers on this call, <laughs> please write more. <laughs> um, so uh, I do want to get us to our question and answer session. So uh, feel free to start putting questions. I know many of you have been all along, but feel free if you have questions. Uh, for David, feel free to drop them in the chat now, um, and we will certainly uh, be, we will certainly be going through them um, in just a few minutes. But um, I know one one particular project that is known far and wide, and, and has I've already seen a few comments about it is Abraham Inc. And so I I personally I I am a big fan. Um, there's something amazing about seeing all um, seeing so many cultures coming together and creating something new and beautiful that is bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, and so if you could just tell us how that project came together and what we're gonna hear when we listen to the title track, Tweet Tweet. Um, well, this is a project that, uh, you know, So Called and I, uh, after I had brought him on board as a, a featured artist in my band, Klezmer Madness, and we were thinking, oh, well, maybe we should do something uh, you know, um, something different. And then uh, so-called sort of said, well, what about Fred Wesley? And this light bulb went off in our head. What if we got the, like basically one of the great architects of uh, funk music, maybe the person who you could say could be credited with creating funk music um, in that he took uh, the, the raw talent of James Brown and kind of codified it and made horn arrangements and uh, made full arrangements and was the musical director for the band. And, um, and, and, and so that was really um, a, a kind of a, like an amazing thing. And we, and I think we, we you know, we, uh, we met Fred and I met Fred at first in New York. He, he came to New York and uh, I think he was perplexed. Like, what are these, what are these crazy Jewish guys want from me? You know? And, um, and then, um, but then, uh, you know, we, we played him some of our music and then we met him and, you know, uh, we kind of, we were in a room together. So, you know, he agreed to meet and we were in a room together, a rehearsal room. And then, um, 
at, at a certain point, you know, we, we were kind of awkward, awkward moment, you know, first date kind of thing. And then Fred Wesley said, give me a beat. And so So Called hit this beat for his tune, Bala Bosta. And um, so Fred started jamming with the beat. I started jamming with Fred and we had chemistry right away. And then uh, we have this tune, Moskowitz and uh, Loops of it, uh, a little pun on Moskowitz and Loops, Loop of it, Moskowitz and Loops of it. And uh, so we, this was a, basically, I took a kind of a tune from the Moskowitz repertoire, shredded it into call and response riffs. And we played that for, and, and so based on a beat that so-called had made. And then Fred did counter lines to my riffs and then he harmonized them that night and we convened the band the next day. And basically Abraham Inc. was born and uh, he went, he flew back to his home in South Carolina. A month later, we came, rehearsed for a couple of days and we made our debut in Car Carnegie Hall. So it was like, whoa, wow. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, just, it wasn't Zero even called, <laughs> it was not even called Abraham Inc. at that time, but then that was born. And um, uh, that was, yeah, that was it. Uh, uh, you know, that's how it was and happening. Yeah. How, how did you guys come to the name Abraham Inc.? I think I, I think I thought of it and I was just sort of thinking um, about Abraham being a kind of a symbolic uh, father, a parent to, uh, to uh, multi-religions, multi-races. And mm -hmm. uh, so that felt good. And that was, that was it. But I also thought, you know, it was like, like, uh, you know, the gangsters uh, murder incorporated. So it was kind <laughs> of also tough, a little badass too, you know. I like it. We need a little bit of both. Indeed. All right, here it is. Tweet, tweet. typing here uh, so, I yep. think Seth's comment sums it up I couldn't love this band anymore nail it <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much yeah um, it, it really felt really feels good every time we don't have that many opportunities to play together but when we do it's it's really fun are there any, um, I think I saw it running by in the chat, but again, it was flying by. Are there any uh, even tentative dates for the ensemble to come back together? Well, the tentative date is in Europe in June. So that's a little, right. if, a little iffy. 
um, we'll, we'll hope, we'll hope, we'll see. Maybe it's outdoor festivals. Uh, there are, you know, diplomatic passes you can get to fly over to Europe. I don't know. Um, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, well, we a very some... impor important question, women musicians and Klezmer. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll just mention very quickly, of course, Alicia Spiegels, my great colleague who I played with in the Klezmatics for years, my longtime guitarist, Cheryl Bailey, longtime bass player, Nikki Parat. Um, I am uh, committed to, um, you know, playing, uh, mixing it up as, as much as possible in, uh, you know, cultures, races, sexes, everything, and sexual orientation, everything. Yeah, that's one of the amazing things about Klezmer and the Klezmer community. I mean, music certainly at large, but definitely in the Klezmer community uh, is it's um, kind of an open, open space for, for people of all kinds to come and just show up for the love of music and the love of interesting culture. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, other questions coming in. There, someone made mention about the source for Tweet Tweet, the, the Moldavian melody. I was wondering if you could just quickly mention where, where does that, yeah, because it is, uh, you're, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, um, I'm trying to remember what collection that comes from, but that came, is that it came from the repertoire of German Goldenstein. Um, so uh, that was, and then we just love that tune, and we especially a little tweet tweet, <laughs> tweet tweet, and that's it um, fit with like the whole idea of like like the funk calls in the middle of a tune, like yep. it, it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that was fun. Um, a, a question, um, how, uh, how would you describe audiences reception of, of your, how, how is, pardon me, I'm misreading this. How have the receptions of audiences um, of Klezmer and of your own work changed throughout your career and how is it different in Europe versus it here? Well, what can I say, um, you know, I, I would say that, at the, you know, I don't know the percentage, but 70 to 80 percent of my work is in Europe, um, you know, performing work. Um, and I, I, I can say that probably the, you know, the, 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 the this symbolically, you know, Jew Jewishness of Judaism is just so powerful there in Europe, of course, with the legacy of the Holocaust with, um, but just, just uh, you know, kind of like, um, as I mentioned before, when the Klezmatics, the Jews were seen as the multicultural uh, Europeans before the war. And, you know, just like the loss of Jewish culture, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, you can't even speak about how devastating that was, but also just for the loss for the European psyche. I mean, many people said, I mean, what if like all the African-Americans disappeared from the United States? What would that do to the American psyche? Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's uh, just, it's very intense. And I think in Europe, it's, uh, uh, there's a synergy, there's an energy. And I think audiences in general in, in Europe are, are extremely uh, curious and educated um, and come and check stuff out. And in, in America, you know, we have this community here but I think, um, um, you know, and there, there are people out in America and I play great concerts in the United States, but it's, it's harder. It's an uphill struggle if you're not like on television every night, uh, <laughs> you don't really exist. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, Europe is, I, I just, I feel good playing in Europe and I think it's, 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 it's a, a great, 
um, you know, I feel very grateful for my European audience. And I feel grateful for my American audience too, but it's, it's, uh, it's a different thing. And the, the government support in Europe is, is a, a commitment to culture. There's a commitment to culture. And I don't know, as we've seen in the last four years, um, I think there are a lot of forces that would snuff culture out in a half a second in this country. Uh, really evil forces that would just say, like, you know, who cares? It's just, you know, but I, I, I yeah. So we, we, anybody doing music, anybody doing the arts, I think we are uh, battling for the, for the soul of our, of our culture. And it's important. Well, I think with that, I think we're just about reaching that time. I know that there are some questions that we didn't get to. Please forgive me. It's, it's never possible to get to everything. But um, on behalf of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of the American Jewish, of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, uh, I just want to offer my, my heartfelt thank you for doing this project or d doing this program with us. I mean, this has been just a, a wonderful conversation. I think it's been very illuminating. Um, I also want to quickly thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Kligman and Beth Kramer for all of your work on, on the other sides of this. And a thank you to Fran Feynman of the David Victor Foundation for um, uh, co-sponsoring our, our Yiddish and Klezmer programming throughout the year. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, say thank you and good night to everybody. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you.